We're here to, to continue a, a series of webinars we've we've held uh, about uh, research discovery and uh, using you know OSF as an example. We have some cool new features for discovery that we'd like to to show off. Um, in fact, the audience here today is going to be among the very first to see some stuff we released just last night uh, that we're really excited about. Um, so we'll look at that uh, here shortly. Um, we had two previous events that if you if you didn't um, attend, they are uh, available to uh, check out with the, the slides and the recordings. Um, one is a, a general um, discussion on uh, discovery and search on the OSF and another focused on um, using discovery as a research funder and um, like a program officer type uh, role. Um, and then today we're going to focus on, uh, from an institutional perspective, someone supporting uh, researchers and a research institution and all of the, the challenges and opportunities therein um, and where discovery comes into uh, to your role. I'll show you some stuff that uh, is available on the OSF in a couple of different uh, ways. Um, and then we'll have some time where I can actually jump in and show you live uh, some of those features and then uh, discussion. Um, to use the the chat like we are here to, to tell us a little bit about yourself, this is really wonderful to see all these different uh, places that everybody's coming from. It's really exciting. Um, so continue to do that. I'm also going to just kind of ask you some, some questions as we go, and you can drop a, a thought in there, a quick phrase. Um, and then there is a Q&A, the separate Q&A panel uh, for Zoom. Um, if you want to drop some questions in, it's much easier for us to sort out what's a question versus just um, you know, observation and a, uh, introduction, um, if you put those in the QA. And then um, my colleague Blaine is, is here uh, on the panel, and she's going to jump in and, and either um, answer your questions or uh, we'll we'll flag me so that we can uh, talk about those as a group. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, if you're just joining, uh, please do uh, feel like you can throw an introduction in the in the chat. And I'm gonna clear some Zoom stuff out of my way so that we can get started. Uh, so uh, today you get uh, me as your guide. I'm the uh, product manager here at, at COS, and um, my role is to to work with the technology that we're going to uh, talk about today and interface that with uh, users, obviously, but also research communities of a number of flavors like uh, institutions. And we work with some institutions in particular uh, very closely, and we'll talk about that uh, today. Um, but continuing to build our technology toward uh, your communities and use cases, rather than something that we just kind of toss out there and, and uh, hope that people will use. So that that's primarily my role here at COS uh, and, and Blaine and Amanda that uh, are, are running our show today are also um, our sort of primary assets in support of this goal uh, at COS. And uh, what we're gonna look at today is just generally talk a little bit about how uh, research um, it is and becomes discoverable and where the institution element of that fits in in particular. Um, a lot of you probably hear a lot about uh, some of these things frequently. Um, so I might be covering some ground that you're familiar with, um, but uh, bear with me because I do have some cool stuff to tell you uh, about where that meets uh, some things that we do in particular with connecting research across the life cycle. Uh, and then OSF search in particular, as I mentioned, we have some really new stuff that's very cool uh, that we want to, to show you and then how to use some of those things. And like I said, I'll, I'll show you some of those live. Um, and quickly, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the OSF yet, uh, I know a number of you are because we have some friends here in the, in the audience. Um, but to just give you a quick sense of where the OSF stands in a landscape of many, many research tools that you and your research communities rely on. Um, the OSF is, is not a typical data repository or research repository. Instead, what it wants to provide is tools 
uh, across the research life cycle that, that support each phase, each of those phases for a, a researcher and a research team and a research community. Uh, it's free for researchers to, to get an account on the OSF uh, and to begin using those, those features and they'll never hit a, a point where you know, they're submitting a, a preprint or submitting their data and are asked for uh, you know a fee in order to to do that. Um, so it's it's always free for their uh, their research purposes. Now we do have some um, additional features that communities can use that um, do require memberships, and we'll actually talk a little bit about those shortly. Um, and just to give you an idea of where this OSF. Um, you know, comes from and how we make, uh, create our priorities and, and develop our tech uh, here at COS. And there's really these three uh, really broad community buckets that uh, we work closely with and um, are our sort of source of inspiration and uh, the direction that we go as an organization and as a technology uh, and so these three are um, our members and supporters. As I mentioned, we have um, memberships that use our suites of tools that are built on the OSF and get funding from other uh, organizations. They're obviously a major stakeholder um, in our mission and in our technology. Um, there are the research data contributors and readers, so the users of the OSF that are creating new content and sharing that uh, with the world. And uh, then readers that are coming to you know consume and and use and re um, refer to that information, uh, and then we have the technology itself is built to be integrated with uh, many other tools, some of which we'll see some examples of shortly. Um, and so this is not something that uh, is a one and done uh, uh, reference to our members or our users or integrators, but rather as a constant dialogue with these uh, communities and many, many communities that fit within those large uh, buckets. But um, our priorities at the OSF and at COS are developed through those conversations. Uh, so that we're building toward what their needs are um, while also, you know, sort of building things that, uh, that uh, users and researchers at the forefront of, of open science practices can start to take advantage of right away, even if uh, their you know, their communities aren't quite all caught up yet, they can help to, to pull those along by using what's possible uh, through the OSF. Um, so when that comes to what you're responsible for, largely at uh, research institutions that are trying to help your researchers be responsible for, um, you get into uh, the, the research sharing and discovery uh, element um, and what you hear all the time uh, is making your data, making your metadata fair. Um, and certainly we take this to heart uh, on the OSF. And so we'll see some examples of this uh, as we go. Um, but we want to enable you and your researchers to make your work findable. We have a lot of different identifiers that we utilize and support. Uh, and some, again, uh, some new metadata, rich metadata, robust metadata options we've added this year um, that I'll show you. Um, having open and uh, accessible um, standards so that even if I do have work that's out there somewhere, it actually could still be accessed and utilized uh, over time um, and interoperable where those standards are now uh, can access um, my system or this system uh, from yours and be able to, to reference those. We'll see some really cool examples of that um, that you're probably somewhat familiar with, but the OSF takes advantage of. Uh, and then reusable has licenses, has uh, provenance on where this data comes from and what it's been through um, so that I can recognize it's, it's uh, how I can reuse uh, that data. Uh, and all of this, you know, is is thrust uh, upon uh, communities like yours. Um, not that you aren't out there pushing this, you know, without uh, the stick of of compliance from research funders, because many of you, um, I, I know you are, uh, you are very interested and advocate for this and are pushing your, your research communities toward open practices because it's valuable 
for them and for you. Um, but then also uh, there are uh, increasingly expectations uh, that these practices become normalized. Uh, and so uh, research funders, these are um, examples in the first two over here in the in the US, um, but also in other regions uh, where research funders and, and agencies are uh, expecting research data management and sharing it at least um, to be provided in order to get the funding that um, is is necessary for a large uh, component of of research, um, and then that they're sort of setting a tone that many other agencies and funders are following, um, and research data sharing and poly, uh, and uh, management is one piece of uh, what is really valuable when we start talking about open practices, and that one. Um, and, and having robust metadata is, is something we're seeing increasingly more of as far as those expectations, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but then there's there's lots of other opportunities too that uh, may be still kind of below the, the surface uh, in terms of what is openly expected and, and is being called for, uh, but yet could still be extremely valuable to um, your own work or those of the researchers you're supporting, um, like uh, pre-registering or essentially a, a management plan for instead of just your data, your entire study, uh, documenting that early um, and having those then be referenced in your your papers later on, which goes back to our, our life cycle um, priority. And having your code and your, your data dictionaries and other supplements in addition to your data be available and open and fair uh, really contributes to that uh, long-term viability of your work. And so thinking about the OSF uh, in particular, we've always have been trying to, to prioritize both uh, ways for you to share and describe your data um, and having robust metadata as well. So this is an example of one of our interfaces in the OSF and OSF project, which is really good for active um, project and data management. Um, and you can see we've got files and data uh, stored in here and a way for me to describe it. Uh, it's linked to further uh, data and descriptive elements and then has metadata like keywords. It has our, our provenance activity log down here. Um, and then several uh, contributors and institutional and um, object identifiers, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and what we realized, though, is that there's still a lot more uh, to um, allow you to describe your work effectively. So earlier this year in January, uh, we launched another uh, a metadata page, which has some new um, metadata fields. Uh, including um, using the data site uh, schema's uh, resource type uh, field. So this is a pick list to help you describe uh, what what kind of information is this this object that you are are sharing. So this one is uh, is a bunch of collected information. So it is described as a collection here, uh, but you can describe this as a data set or a or a paper um, or I think it's fourteen or fifteen different object types the data site uh, enables, um, and then also funder support, this one being particularly critical in those compliance areas we were mentioning earlier. Um, so as a researcher, you can now add your uh, funder through the Crossref funder uh, API, uh, funder registry API, so they don't have to try to remember precisely how to spell it, and then the funder has to try to find it in you know, every which way by searching for it instead. They pick it from the API list, um, and it has a funder identifier to be easily uh, found that way by the funder and by others. And then uh, affiliate institutions, and I'll talk a little bit about how this is uh, enabled here in a moment. But when you sort of cross cross reference all of these uh, these metadata, you get some really great uh, opportunities for not just discovery, but also from your perspective as uh, research support at an institution, um, you can learn a lot about the activity at your institution by uh, utilizing all of these tools. And I'll show you some of that uh, here shortly. 
So just in to summarize what's now enabled in the uh, the metadata on OSF, we primarily are using the the data site metadata schema. So we're trying to standardize as the the fair um, uh, goals would would have us. Uh, and then there are areas we we support in the OSF that are not quite generalizable to the data site schema, but um, everywhere possible, we are using the data site schema. Um, and we use the controlled lists for those resource types, the funders, the disciplines, license uh, dates, obviously, and then authors and affiliations where um, we can use uh, persistent identifiers for those. Uh, so uh, OSF is already supporting a number of uh, persistent identifiers for objects with DOIs, um, ORCID IDs for authors, they can add them to their uh, profiles, and so they don't have to manually include them every time they submit new content on OSF. They just include them with their author profile when we submit those with the metadata. ROAR IDs for those institutional affiliations. Uh, if you haven't heard of a, the ROAR IDs before, those are uh, it's the research organization registry. So it's similar to an ORCID ID, but for a, a place. Uh, and I can tell you more about that um, if you are interested. Uh, we're friends with uh, Roar, um, and then also the Crossref funder registry for those funder identifiers. Um, and then you can use relationships that are enabled in the OSF to connect all of those various things together, the people, the places, the things that you work with uh, across the whole life cycle. Uh, we have those relationships enabled already, uh, so you can connect it all together. Um, and then we have, I'll, I'll show you our application profile for metadata, which is really a, a neat tool, um, which outlines all of the, the metadata that we uh, support and enable on the OSF. So you can see all of the possible relationships and the standards that are referred to uh, in those uh, resources. Um, and then you can also, even all the way down to the file level, um, add specific metadata to those files, um, including a description and the, the data type. Uh, we don't meant DOIs for specific files. We do that at the container level, but you can add uh, specific metadata to each file. Uh, and I'll drop a link to this in the chat, or maybe Blaine can uh, can grab it for us. Um, but this is our metadata excuse me metadata application profile, which is completely open and public. Uh, and you can see Gretchen here is one of our colleagues on the uh, product team, is our sort of primary uh, owner of the metadata application profile, which is a librarian and metadata expert, who is a resource for uh, many of our members and users that we referred to earlier. Um, and so you'll see that it's, it gets updated every time we have new relationships and metadata enabled on the OSF, but it's really neat. I just kind of captured a piece of it here, um, but you can see the, the standards that we refer to, um, that being, again, one of those fair uh, goals. Um, and then lay all the labels that get used across our uh, metadata on the OSF. So really cool uh, instrument here. If you if you really want to know the, all of the the universe of metadata available on the OSF, then the application profile has all of that. And then we have support uh, uh, guides for all of the metadata practices on the OSF that are available to you or to um, uh, your researchers to to realize and demonstrate how to take advantage of those tools that we just uh, talked about. Um, and then, you know, a really critical part of any of that is that uh, as with the the interoperable part of that that fair uh, standard uh, would tell us is that you know, this is only so useful if it's just stuck here in the OSF and is not findable or um, uh, were interoperable with other systems across the research life cycle. Um, so one of the important things is to support the infrastructure that uh, other research communities are relying on. And so um, I just grabbed uh, one example here of a, of a project that we support. Actually, this is a uh, data management sharing plan uh, for an NIH project that we're working on um, here at, at COS. And you could just see just within this, you know, short um, uh, snapshot that we have a, a contributor with their ORCID ID, Nicole here, um, and then data site uh, standard 
pick list fields with the resource type. This one um, is labeled as an output management plan, so a data management plan. Um, and it even includes a, a language reference there. And then that funder identifier, in this case, NIH um, included some other information about the specific uh, program uh, grant as well in here, uh, and then has some license information and the affiliation. Um, and so now when that gets submitted, we meant a DOI for uh, that this object here, um, and that goes to data site. And now data site has all this information about uh, what we just submitted, including um, you know the the general metadata like descriptions, but also the license information, the language, the creator with her ORCID ID and her affiliation. Um, it includes uh, information about the the OSF, which is the publisher host as a repository, in addition to her affiliation, and then the funding uh, identifier. Uh, itself uh, as well. And now, whether you're coming from uh, the funder perspective and an IH program officer trying to find all the impact that your funding had over the last year, or we're COS trying to collect all the cool stuff that uh, we're sharing and producing, or just Nikki that's trying to, to continue to update the things that she's working on, the identifiers will sync all of that together. So you can, um, in Nikki's case, she has her data site and uh, ORCID sync on, um, so she didn't have to add any of this manually to her ORCID record. It gets added automatically to her ORCID record from OSF via data site. Um, and through those identifiers, any of those stakeholders can find uh, that same information. And this is just a look of on the OSF side. Uh, when we search for it, uh, we find that same information and a summary of um, of that particular project. Whoops, back a second here. Um, and so I, I have a sort of animation to summarize all of this. Um, and OSF is not uh, alone in terms of tools that offer some really cool features like this. There are other uh, repositories too uh, that are really great um, in our community. And where the OSF is unique is that it has all of those lifecycle relationships uh, enabled. Um, but let me go back here and play this again because it's stuttering on me a little bit. Um, but when a researcher comes and supports or uh, submits their content to the OSF, we want to learn some things about them. So we have their uh, ORCID ID uh, in their profile. We have their uh, ROAR ID for their institution um, that they have an affiliation with. Back this out for a second here. See if this will play for us. Um, and as when they submit that content, we pull that information into the OSF. Maybe not. Um, so I'll just sort of point um, as this uh, the information we have about the researcher comes into the OSF, we meant to DOI for that content, uh, include all of that that we know about the author and about their content. So the DOI now has the ORCID ID, it has the ROAR identifier, and it has the DOIs for all of the associated data and other data management plans, all the other objects in there. We meant that from uh, data site, it, the, that same info can go to uh, the ORCID record of that particular researcher, uh, the uh, funder information is on there, the funder identifier, where NIH uh, can consume that uh, and determine where their funding dollars are going in terms of outputs. And then the ROAR identifier is on there. So the research institution uh, can similarly discover all of the content uh, that their researchers are, um, are, are depositing, they're sharing and through those open uh, mechanisms, in this case on the OSF. And so where that comes back to that life cycle conversation um, is those relationships that are enabled there. So that that DOI with a ROAR ID and an identifier and a funder identifier um, can also include all of this other information about your research. It doesn't have to be just a paper and you're done, uh, but it's a paper that's linked to a preprint that's linked to a uh, data set that's 
linked to uh, my pre-registration, my analysis plan from the very beginning. All of that's all associated. It's all in the metadata. It all gets submitted uh, to data site in that DOI. Um, so where does this part sort of link up on the institution side and those were identifiers? So we actually have a tool specifically for that um, in the OSF. Uh, as I mentioned, a researcher can always get a, an account for free uh, on the OSF. Now, if a research institution wants to sort of take advantage and, and track um, all of the, uh, the cool uh, work that their researchers are doing and sharing on the OSF, then this is a tool that they would utilize. Oops, there we go. Um, and so this is uh, OSF institutions. We actually have a couple of um, members in the uh, audience today. Um, and uh, where this tool comes in um, is verifying where the researcher, uh, that the researcher belongs to your institution. So we use single sign-on for that, which you use probably for many, many uh, services already uh, at your institution. Um, and that verifies that, that a researcher is part of a particular um, uh, university. And then at that point, uh, the work that they do can get affiliated and aggregated. And that helps to, to meet those requirements of, of data sharing and showcase the, the outputs and, and um, impact being a loaded word here, but generally the, the aggregate of impact that your institution is having from an open practice uh, perspective um, is where this, this tool comes in. And so that when you become a member, it's not just an infrastructure offering, although that's really cool. And I'll show you uh, what it looks like here in a moment. Um, but for all of your users on the OSF, they get uh, help desk prioritization. Uh, Blaine, who's with us today, is one of our team members who frequently supports uh, users in the help desk. Um, you have a dedicated product owner, so uh, Gretchen that we mentioned earlier, um, and others that as needed uh, from my team on the, the product team uh, will support your your needs and using the, the technology as well as related uh, open practices. Um, we have onboarding materials for you and training so that you know how to use all of these, these pieces. Um, an institutional dashboard and aggregate page, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and then we submit reports. Um, right now it's twice annually, which aggregates all of the cool um, usage that uh, your uh, community is, is leveraging the OSF for um, so that any of this you could track um, and report on your own, uh, but we'll, we'll also submit uh, reports for you to simplify that task. Um, so before I jump in to uh, show you some of those pages live, just to quickly summarize where this fits into the new uh, search features on the OSF. Um, so we have a lot of the search features you expect on the uh, on a data repository like uh, the text searching and wildcards that are available there. But where it gets really neat um, is you can filter by the those OSF content types. So where in the lifecycle uh, that research is is coming from or what it supports. Um, you can filter by those funders that we talked about earlier and then the uh, affiliated institutions um, by the providers. Uh, we support community services uh, for registries and collections and preprints uh, so communities can stand up their own versions using our infrastructure. And then those relationships we mentioned earlier, whether they've connected data and code and other resources. And so there's millions of combinations of all of this. Um, and you can have as many of these combinations as you want. Um, and so from an institutional perspective, being able to, um, to actually, let me just jump right into this live here. Um, so let me go to the search page first. So uh, this is our search page, the general search page on the OSF. And if I'm a, a reader who is interested in knowing, um, we, have, we saw University of Maryland earlier, so I'm going to actually use them as our example, actually right there. So um, just right off the bat, before I even um, start on some of my search operations, I can limit things down to uh, just content that is affiliated with uh, someone from the University of Maryland. And then now I can continue to filter that down um, to just the subject areas that are of interest to me um, or um, the 
providers that they've submitted their their content to. Um, we'll see there's a couple of our general OSF ones, uh, as well as one of our other community registries. Um, I can also see all the other institutions that um, they may have collaborated with. In this case, they have something that they've worked on. Uh, Cornell University, another one of our members with. Um, so just from the general search page, I've got some of these things I can take advantage of uh, right away. Of course, you can flip it around and start from uh, funder. For example, we started with the NSF. We could see which institutional members have something that is funded by the NSF. So we have a few here um, from uh, ourselves here at CEOS, as well as Notre Dame, South Carolina, Virginia Tech, all members, of course. Um, and then what is something we just launched uh, last night. Uh, so you are, again, one of the very first uh, to see this. I'm going to pick on uh, Maryland again here. Um, so this is their brand new uh, aggregate page, um, which is a uh, really neat. And, and now you can, um, now that we're on their, their page, I can filter by the content types on the OSF. So I can see all of the, the users that are from verified to be from the University of Maryland through that single sign-on, 768 of them um, that have been uh, verified affiliates. We can go to their OSF profiles from here. There's actually um, some more, another release coming in a couple of weeks that's going to put more information about the users in here, which will be equally cool. Um, but then I can also see their OSF uh, projects and use those uh, filters that we were mentioning earlier. So I could see all of their OSF projects that have associated preprints, for example, um, and use that filter. Um, if I were to go over to our registrations, I could similarly narrow down the resources that are from University of Maryland, are our registration, and have related uh, data. Um, and there are, the preview here will always tell me how many results I can expect if I were to use one of these filters. So in this case, um, you know, I've got some lower numbers, but then there, you know, I have some up, up here that are just too high. Like I, the, I'm not going to sort through 152 University of Maryland pro, uh, registrations that have the CC4 license. So I'm going to continue to narrow that down into uh, some more ma manageable number uh, based on maybe if there's a, another collaborative institution here, well, not in this case, um, but by subject or uh, provider. Um, and can continue to narrow these results down. Um, so this is a, a feature that is available only to those uh, OSF institutions uh, members, um, but some of those elements we were talking about earlier about uh, trying to, to keep track of the uh, compliance and other obligations, there's a lot of tools here now um, that uh, Sarah at the University of Maryland could take advantage of very quickly. And, you know, if she's to going to advocate for her, her uh, uh, users to uh, integrate their their ORCID ID or to include their funder um, on their in the metadata of their work on the OSF, they'll see the return on that right away. It's not something that's hidden away. Um, if uh, Melody here were to add some of that metadata uh, to her project, it's immediately going to be available to uh, discover and filter by uh, on the, the University of Maryland page here, as well as the, the general search uh, pages. Um, and that, I think, is really important to sort of motivate the Melody or other users to take advantage of those tools. They can just quickly see that there is, is uh, a benefit uh, to that work. Um, so that's largely why we've done this in the sequence that we have, you know, ne enabled this metadata and then uh, created these really neat search features uh, to take advantage of them. So um, those are things that uh, anybody, any user can start taking advantage of, adding their funder information and their work at IDs. Uh, and then OSF institutional uh, members can take advantage of pages like this um, and that extra discovery that the ROAR IDs uh, take advantage of. Um, and there's, we even added some new discovery stuff here. So. Uh, we add more IDs to cross-ref uh, uh, DOIs for preprints. That's a new uh, feature that's discoverable here now. Um, and then also even files that are within containers. Uh, so they have quite a quite a few files here, obviously, that are affiliated. Uh, so some really, really cool stuff uh, to learn within these, these pages here. And then the general search page that 
uh, enable some discovery and learning and tracking uh, from an institutional perspective uh, in particular. Uh, let me just wrap up here because I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's coming next um, that is related to this. Um, so we have these really great uh, standard metadata fields that were important you know, from a fair perspective to be consistent uh, in the kind of things we're trying to, to gather from our users. But at the same time, um, being standard like that isn't going to capture a unique metadata that some communities or projects or or disciplines um, are going to have. Um, and so what we're going to do for that uh, is enable a tool called the uh, CDAR uh, embeddable editor. So um, the CDAR workbench is a tool that anybody can use. It's uh, built out of Stanford where you can build your own metadata taxonomy uh, and then it's hosted there. Um, and so by integrating the embeddable editor, uh, we could select the, some of those community uh, taxonomies and then those are available on the OSF for uh, a user to select and then complete, fill out all of those unique metadata fields and items. Uh, and then we include that metadata in that same OSF object and, and some of it would be discoverable through those same uh, tools that we just looked at. So a huge opportunity here to um, add some unique metadata that, that you know a standard approach would never be able to satisfy. Uh, so, so this is coming uh, soon. We've just started this uh, project, so a few months. Uh, this is something we'll we'll share out, uh, but we're really excited uh, about enabling that for other uh, communities. Uh, and then I just like to wrap up on on this note, um, where uh, you know, the metadata things that we talked about and the other practices. Uh, a lot of you are are doing most of this already. It's you know really impressive how fast uh, research institutions have um, been able to get adoption on a lot of these practices. But uh, even still, um, if you don't, if there are pieces here that you're not doing yet, you're not, uh, you're not a, a poor advocate. It just means that uh, there's more that we can do to help you um, to, to support those and, and just building on top of the practices that you have now um, that you're already using, like uh, really robust metadata and encouraging the ORCID records and, and DOIs and things like that is all amazing and unlocks so much stuff. Uh, so continuing to do that uh, is, is amazing. And please do talk to us about struggles trying to get to some of these other, other items, um, but just keep taking that uh, one day at a time and, and uh, building toward more of these practices as appropriate. You know, if your discipline or community is, you know, rejected pre-registration is something appropriate to them, then that's completely fine. Um, but those are tools that are available here in the OSF if that is something that uh, that they want to try. Um, so I'll leave this uh, resource page up while we turn over to the Q and A. Um, and Blaine will put some of those links in the chat. Um, all right, let me open the QA here. Please do drop uh, questions in the QA though, if you have anything for us. Um, we have a question uh, Do you also link the research product with registration of clinical studies? Um, so if you're, uh, if you registered your clinical study with like clinicaltrials.gov, for example, um, then what they enable on, on their side, obviously we can't control. Um, but if you have a public DOI uh, for that uh, registration, um, and then you decided you were going to like archive your some of the data outputs or, or something uh, on the OSF end, you could link out to that uh, pre-registration as a relationship. Um, we don't have, data site doesn't have a uh, resource type for the uh, study, um, it's going to be called study registration, I think is uh, what uh, it's going to be called in the next data site release uh, later, hopefully later this year. Um, so we can't add that to it yet, but we will uh, shortly, obviously, because we have a lot of those on the OSF. Um, but you would be able to, to link that DOI um, to your other OSF outputs. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. Um, 
how do we measure relevance? Great question. Um, so this is something we I talked about a lot um, in terms of uh, what are the the different fields that we would or different ways of sorting uh, that we would enable. And so one of the things we do there is uh, is all of the different fields that uh, actually, let me just go back here and uh, I'll show you. Um, so all of the the different fields that the search, uh, discovery tools are, are looking into. So if I just try science here, um, you can see in, in each result here, there's a really cool, just as you would expect in something like uh, uh, Google, will tell you where we're finding that term um, as, as this context field. So in this case, uh, science was uh, twice uh, a keyword um, in these all categories is not a great example of this. Let me switch over to uh, registrations. Um, and so we weigh uh, which fields these are coming from um, a little bit differently in terms of uh, how they would would rank um, in the relevance um, and then try to include um, ones that have some pretty robust metadata. So these included manually added uh, keywords um, in this case for this registration. Uh, so that elevated uh, some of the relevance ranking here. Um, but relevance is a tough, um, for any search tools, uh, is, is a tough thing to sort of decide upon. Um, we have some more features that are coming uh, soon, for example, um, where this will search uh, among the contributor names too. And so um, that'd be one that, you know, we would be careful in terms of how we uh, weight it um, so that, uh, you know, somebody named Joe Science, um, you know, isn't just gonna pop up all the time on these relevance um, rankings when I search for that term. Um, but that's a that's a great question. All right. Are there any other? Oh, I see some questions in the chat. Mechaniz, uh, mechanism for verified users when they change institutions. So um, if a user changes institutions, uh, for one, they won't be able to continue to access the OSF through their previous. Oh, actually, Blaine um, didn't answer this, but they won't. Uh, they won't continue to have access through their previous institution if they're they're um, verification is no longer uh, enabled, um, but they can still continue to use the OSF. That uh, that account belongs to them. Um, so we give them a method for setting a different access um, uh, using a, a password or using ORCID ID to log in. So they don't lose any other data. Um, and then if they do join another institution or they can actually be part of multiple institutions at once. Um, so if I were to you go to my dashboard here and I'll show you. Um, for me personally, I have two affiliations. Um, so when I start new uh, content on the OSF, both of my affiliations are on by default. And if I somehow were to continue to join more institutions simultaneously, then I would have more uh, available here. And if I were to leave completely be, you know, out of one, um, then one of those could be removed completely. But in this case, I could just turn it off for this submission, um, so that only COS will be the um, the affiliated institution for my submission here. Um, so yeah, the affiliations can be removed by users and um, in some circumstances by the institutions. Um, and as you go and continue your career and become affiliated with other uh, organizations, you can have those uh, be newly added to your uh, profile to your account as available affiliations. All right. Um, see another question about, oh, about some, uh, just chatting again later. Yeah, please do, um, if you wanna talk to us, um, send us a note, send us an email and I'll be happy to set up time 
to talk to you. Um, Alejandro asks, uh, is it OSF institutions for, uh, is it free? I mean, it's not free. There is um, actually still a, uh, a entry level uh, membership option at 2,500 or sort of typical option is at uh, 5,000 as Blaine uh, mentioned here. Those are annual uh, fees and you get all of those features um, that we mentioned uh, earlier. But the, your researchers do not, they don't have to be part of an a, a institutional member to start using the OSF. That is, uh, uh, the OSF is completely free to them. Uh, but if they want those affiliations available and you want the aggregate page um, as an institution, then, then that's where you would uh, need to become a member. All right, any other questions, Blaine? No, nope, that seems to be it. All right, fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for all the engagement. It's wonderful to see uh, participants from all over uh, the world today. Really, really cool. Um, we do have a, we have webinars, at least a one a week. Um, so some are coming up that are about uh, these interfaces we talked about today. We also have one that's really about uh, jumping into the introduction, the basics of the OSF, uh, which is a new, uh, really a new kind of uh, webinar for us. Um, that one is a week from today. Um, so please do come and, and join us for those two or, or send your uh, your community members to come and see if that's something that they want to try. Um, and we would love to, to talk to them uh, and talk to you. So please do reach out to us and uh, or um, send us your contact info and we can reach out to you uh, later. But uh, thank you for joining us and hope to see you again.